My name is Nicholas Follin. I'm a South Australian based artist uh, and this work is called Jump Up which refers to a small hill. For me this was an excellent opportunity to create new work. Uh, I'm very very familiar with this gallery, uh, particularly this colonial wing. It's always been a favourite of mine. I've enjoyed coming in here. My own ancestors came to South Australia in the late 1830s and many of these works were produced around that same time. So I find it fascinating to search these works, perhaps for traces of my own family. I'm also very, very curious about why these people came out to Australia um, during that early part of colonisation. Um, you know, I think it must have been a very, very fearful thing, but they were coming to a land where there was a great deal of promise, um, but a great deal of risk as well. And I think that kind of, of desire for another place, for, for a kind of land of promise, is something that we all hold, perhaps only as a metaphor. And so this work is actually based on an island that's in the Mediterranean, an island called Thera, which is one of the spaces that's thought to have possibly been the location of Atlantis. There was clearly uh, a very advanced civilization there at some stage before a volcanic eruption, uh, and there's no trace and no known uh, history beyond that volcanic eruption. So this work is essentially a map of that island and I guess I chose that island because I think that desire and that speculation about these lands of promise is very, very similar in the way that we fictionalise and romanticise Atlantis uh, and I think that must have been very, very similar to the way that people romanticised Australia. They must have known that the fictions existed and that there was a lot of um, exaggeration and, and perhaps falsification in the early stories that came out of countries like Australia. Um, but they must have also felt that there was incredible opportunity to be had. The work's located in such a way that when you walk into the gallery, through the front entrance, through the vestibule, your first vision of this work is actually from a considerable distance, and that was important to me. It's also very, very important that the lower level of the work is completely flat. Uh, it helps the work to float, it helps it to be at some, some kind of mysterious distance, I guess, from the self, that the thing seems almost unbelievable and, and perhaps a little bit uncanny within this space. The closer you move to it, you begin to realise that actually it's a grouping of islands, that it's not a single island, it's actually two islands that create a kind of, um, I guess, a protected cove within its heart. Uh, and you can begin to kind of negotiate that space as you move in and around the piece itself. Glassware is something that I've used a lot in my practice uh, in the past, but it's something that really I've used because it has a, a specific relationship to the, to the ideas that I have. I don't see myself specifically as a glass artist, although I, I've been working more and more in glass over time, um, and I've in a way been adopted a little bit by the glass community. But in the case of this work, uh, the glassware has a very specific nostalgic uh, relationship. To, to our own histories. We all recognise the glasswork. It's something that perhaps we don't have in our own homes, but our parents and our grandparents certainly would have, even if it was at the back of a cupboard. And it used to be a very popular wedding gift. So everybody did have this glassware. It's simply since become an item that, that people discard readily. I think there's something really quite nice in the value adding of materials like this because it's not seen to have much value now. And in fact, during the installation of this work, which was produced over about a 10 night period, I, I built the work in the evenings and during the day the, the public could come through and see the glassware laid out on the floor in preparation for going up into the installation. Um, and there were people within the public who questioned why this cheap glass was in a location like this. It's kind of the sum of the parts that give value to materials like this. Individually, they have very, very little value. But once they're transformed, they become you know, just elements within a much greater picture, and that adds considerable value to the work. In addition to that, though, there are a number of cut glass works within Gallery 3 surrounding this work, and I think that's a really beautiful thing too. In terms of this specific gallery space, uh, something I noticed and, and something that I guess I was partly aware of before beginning to work on this particular piece is that there are many, many paintings within these spaces that depict the ocean in one way or another. Most of them are looking out to sea, some of them are looking, uh, looking towards land and I found that fascinating in itself. I don't know that that's something that you'd find in every colonial gallery in every country of the world. I think it's possibly specific to the nature of the way that people were being transported at the time, that many of the, well all of the 
the people that were, were landing here during colonial times had travelled across the ocean in a very, very risky kind of journey. My own ancestors lost several siblings on the way across. Um, but the fact that these ocean works exist, I think, is very, very fascinating. And I wasn't really sure whether it was uh, a kind of longing to escape or whether it was just an acknowledgement of, of where people had travelled from. So to build an island structure within this space, and, and considering that Australia is an island in itself, seemed a very, very appropriate way to deal with the existing hang within these galleries.